as an opening up as we host this program online through the new school. We acknowledge that we are now occupying a space that rests and operates within what is, at least for some, an unceded territory that this place has always been, as Lenape Hoking or Manhattan, among others, part of a network of intersecting indigenous movements and in the ongoing struggle for indigenous liberation. We ask that you join us in acknowledging indigenous communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations, especially as we tune in virtually, we recognize that this program takes place, takes place from, takes the place of space while searching for solidarity with all indigenous peoples here and beyond whose land was stolen to create settler states and who continue to live under siege surveillance and colonial structural violence on their own occupied lands and waters. This acknowledgement should not function as acceptance or closure, but as a call, a call in to commit to work to reconfigure our notions about ourselves and to take on the responsibility in the face of possibility to dismantle the ongoing effects of settler colonialism. With many thanks to Jackson Paulus and Jamie Barizo for working with us on this tech. And now with this call in place, it's my great pleasure to turn the virtual room over to Ileana Capero, who is an assistant professor of modern and contemporary art history and visual studies at the New School. Uh, thank you very much. Joshua, hello everyone and welcome. And I would like to um, uh, give my appreciation to Professor Joshua Lubin Levy, to Rafael Munoz, to Professors Will Greenberg, Soyon Yoon, and Janine Tan for helping to organize this event. Tonight, I am delighted to introduce Cuban artist Tania Bruguera to all of you. Born in Havana, Tania enrolled at the art schools in the city from the elementary level to Instituto Superior de Arte, the Arts College in Havana. In 2001, she earned her MFA in performance from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Right after graduation, besides her artistic practice, Tania got deeply involved with pedagogical endeavors. In 2002, she founded Arte de Conducta, which in English is something uh, as the Behavioral or Behavior Art School, the first performance studies program in Latin America, and a program that at the time was hosted by the Arts College in Havana. She ran Arte de Conducta until 2009. From 2003 through 2010, she was an assistant professor at the Department of Visual Arts of the University of Chicago. And from 2010 till 2015, she launched the Immigrant Movement International, a 5 year project presented in partnership with New York's Queens Museum and Creative Time. For the, first year, for the first year, Tanya shared a small apartment in Corona neighborhood, Queens, with five undocumented immigrants and their six children. She lived on a minimum wage and without health insurance to better understand the hardships of many immigrants when they come to the United States. Part of the project involved volunteers offering educational programming, language, nutrition, and dance classes, along with free healthcare and daycare services. In 2016, Tanya launched another pedagogical initiative, the International Institute of Artivism, Hannah Arendt. Artivism is the combination of two words, art plus activism, and the acronym is INSTAR. The opening performance which marked its creation coincided with the date of Cuba's declaration of the Republic, May 20th, and consisted of a 100-hour uh, reading and discussion of Anna, Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism by over 50 participants. We, we should remember that Hannah Arendt was a prestigious faculty member of this school from 1967 until 1975 when she died. Uh, tonight, Tania will speak from Havana, where she currently is researching ways in which art can be applied to everyday political life, not only as a tool for self-reflection, but as a way to generate and install models for social interactions that could provide new ways to engage with this word that we um, uh, always use and is kind of elusive, which is utopia. So while I talk to Tania, I'm gonna show some of the images so you have an understanding of what her performances more or less were uh, across her trajectory. Uh, Tanya, welcome to the new school. We are very happy to have you uh, tonight. 
And let's begin your study in 1992. So I'm going to share the screen so you can see some images. Okay. Okay, let's begin here. Okay. So in 1992, you organized an exhibition called Ana Mendieta Tania Uruguera, in which you reperform all the works that Cuban American artist Mendieta made in Cuba between 1980 and 1985. So this is the time in which Ana Mendieta returns to Cuba after her exile in the 60s, and she made um, a number of works in Cuba. So I have two questions for this. Why was Mendieta such a strong inspiration for you? And the second question is, do you see your performance practice in the 90s as an heir of the Cuban art scene of the 80s when very young artists, even teenagers, went to the streets, enacted all sorts of performances and became political activists? Or was it a counterpoint to the return to Eastern painting of Cuban artists after the country opened itself to tourism or both? Hmm. Well, first of all, I want to thank Ileana for uh, inviting me to this and, and to prepare uh, to, you know, this event and also to the new school, which as you said, uh, it is uh, a place where Hannah Arendt was, uh, Faculty. Ana Mendieta uh, was a seminal figure for the Cuban development of Cuban art because she came uh, from New York with a very different point of view of what art is and how politics is related to art. And I think she came back to Cuba um, in order to maybe find some stuff she have lost or reconnect, reconnect with something she has lost. But um, at the same time, what she did was um, she influenced a whole generation of young artists in Cuba to whom she talked quite frankly, quite directly, quite brutally with brutal honesty. And at the same time, she was a woman which in the macho culture of the Cuban art world, this was also a bit of a shock. Um, I was supposed to meet her because she was coming in and out. And so, and I met uh, Gerardo Mosquera, the, the art critic, and he said to a group of young artists where I was, don't worry, you'll meet her. He talked to us about it. He even gave me, which I still have, a postcard signed by Ana Mendieta. And, um, and then she died. I have to make parenthesis, she was killed. And, um, and then the encounter never happened. So Ana Mendieta, after she, she died, became a different symbol. She became for Cuban art, not only a symbol of a culture that is transnational, but also became the symbol of the need to recognize um, two Cubas, you know, Cuba, a Cuba that is inside Cuba and a Cuban that is outside Cuba, and trying to understand what are the the interconnection between those realities, you know, what uh, wish owes what to 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 which one, no? So I think uh, more or less very quickly because it's a ten year project, so this is a very quick uh, talk about it. But in relation with the, with the performance, I think one of the interests I had in performance, which I actually learned about performance through two ways. One was through Ana Mendieta's work. I discovered performance through Ana Mendieta. In a different way, because in Cuba we had actions, we had um, happenings, but Ana Mendieta had a different relationship with the body and, and you know, as a source, and I felt that the reason why I, I um, you know, I, I needed to do performance in Cuba is because it's one of the ways in which you can talk to power and at the same time talk to people. Sometimes visual arts become a practice that is a little endogamic and a little um, elitist in a way. Even if we are trying to do social projects or political projects, sometimes the language that we use is a little 
it's a little, um, I don't know, part of a community where we all understand um, certain concepts, preconceptions of things. And it doesn't arrive very easily to the people. And performance is a way, it's a practice that of course uses everyday life tools like behavior, action, reaction, and so on. So definitely it was also a response, as you said in your question, to a shift in the Cuban art uh, world where in the 80s you found a generation that was more interested in in uh, reflecting the in-depth, uh, a difficult process, um, the, you know, a social difficult process, you know, with the contradictions, with the um, high and lows, no? But in the 90s, that shift, because that generation from the 80s left and the Ministry of Culture um, acknowledged the idea of, um, the art market. And that completely changed the ecosystem because first of all, the, the Ministry of Culture created um, state galleries, state commercial galleries as a way to take successful arts, launch them commercially and take 50% or more of their sales and also control them. I feel that that shift was brilliant because it was a way to control artists. Once you are a middle class, um, once you have um, something to lose, you might think twice what kind of art you want to do. And I think uh, I wanted to, at the same time people were painting or doing sculpture for a potential collector in the US, or Europe, I was doing performance because I wanted to reclaim the possibilities that we had as culture to bring to the world something different. And I felt this, the way Cuban art can uh, add something to the international conversation is precisely through political and social art. Okay. Um, let me talk about then your early performances and I'm going to share the screen again. Um, okay. So, um, Tanya, your early performances entail physical strength. I remember seeing this performance in Havana, in Havana, uh, back in 1996. It was Studio Studi, Studio Study, mm -hmm. when you were pinned to a wall by metal restraints filled with cotton, and you held in your hands slabs of raw meat. Mm -hmm. For a year later, in 1997, when you covered your naked body with a headless lamb carcass and you ate actual dirt mixed with water in the burden of guilt. Uh, later, some of your performances stirred a lot of controversy, such as uh, this one at the Tate in London in 2008, Tadmin Whisper number five, in which two mounted policemen in uniform were brought into the museum and patrolled the space, guiding and controlling the audience by using a minimum of six crowd control techniques, or this notorious performance that it was pretty scandalous in Bogota, Colombia, when an assistant carried a tray laden with lines of cocaine for the audience to consume, or your piece, Self-Sabotage, from the same year, when during the Venice Biennial, you sat at a table reading speech, but from time to time, you held a gun and played the Russian roulette on yourself. So there is a pattern across all these performances. Uh, they are all very provocative and kind of shocking for the audience. Some people consider shock value an important currency in their world. Others view it as plain opportunism. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, it's interesting that uh, it's interesting that uh, some of these projects had elements that people forget, and this is one of the challenge of of uh, working with shock value. Let's say 
because the element that is shocking to people takes over the subtleties, the other subtle elements. But I have to say that um, at least the one from Colombia and uh, from, from uh, self-sabotage, they were part of a research I was doing on uh, perf uh, conferences as performances. So I did a series of performances focused on um, the format of lectures and trying to figure out how to do lectures in a different way. I even did one with uh, the Weatherman Underground members, uh, Bill Ayers and, um, and uh, yeah, Bill, Bill and Bernardine. And um, so I was trying to figure out uh, different formats for performance since uh, it was a practice that I was doing a lot of the lectures and so on. Um, I, I think that um, there is a, all my work is a research. I don't, I never, I have never sat down and, and thought, what can I do that is shocking? I, I, I've never done that. Um, and it's interesting because, for example, when I did the, the one with the carcass, the lamb carcass that you, you mentioned now, like it's normal, that one had a shock value as well. And, and it's interesting because I feel, I almost feel that there is a gap between what I'm thinking as an artist and what other people are perceiving. And I think that gap comes out of um, a process that I'm trying to break, which is the conformity of, of the social, you know? How can you, uh, how can you create work that put the, the viewer or the participant or the audience in a position where they break out the preconceived barriers, like all the, you know, all of us build these huge walls around us. And I, I feel that art can only happen if you are able to break those walls or at least crack them. You know? And sometimes what people think is shock value is, is kind of sad that people say that because it's not about shocking somebody. It's about having a process that is quite generous over top in which you invite somebody to do something that usually they will not do. And I was surprised when people talk about shock value in art when in real life you have people who are violating women and nobody's doing anything about it, when you are governments doing, uh, taking the rights of, of a citizen and people don't find shock value on that. I think it's, it's very interesting and almost feel a little bourgeois, this approach of shock value, uh, almost as, oh, you are, uh, you know, disturbing me. No. Yeah, but what what about the things governments do to the citizens? Why are you not why are you not shocked by that? You know, and and I feel it's interesting because the when you enter the space of art, there is an unspoken agreement that you are going into an experience, and hopefully you are putting yourself in the hands of someone that is a professional in handling emotions, a professional in trying to work out different perspective of the world. So why is it shock? I, I have never understood that. For example, in the one in Colombia, um, people focus on the distribution of cocaine, but people don't remember that I had set up um, a lecture with four members of the conflict in, in Colombia, like, uh, you know, a desplazado, which is somebody who is being displaced from the, because of the war, um, somebody with a family that is missing, someone who is from FARC uh, army, and someone who is a paramilitary who killed people. And it was interesting that you had these people there in person talking about their processes, talking about what was happening in Colombia at that time, and people were bored. 
people were not happy. People were like, oh, what is this about? It's so boring. But then the trade of cocaine came and everybody got excited. Who, who is doing the shock value? Me or the audience? And the other thing is that it is in some, in some areas, it is a little dishonest because people get shocked by things that happens every day. Just because you put a frame around it and make it more clear doesn't mean that it's a negative. Okay, so um, expanding on that, can we say that um, these performances is like holding a mirror in a way to these societies? Because uh, for example, in Colombia, I remember the whole controversy around that and people get, very, Colombians themselves got very uh, offended. Americans, that was done through an American institution. Americans who in front of me the night before were sniffing cocaine, you know, in the rooms, in the hotel, the next day were shocked by this performance. It's, I think is we need to be more as a specialist. I think the public then is a different. We have to to understand that when we work in the public sphere, we have the responsibility to educate as well. You know, to educate not only in terms of social and political issues, but also educate in terms of emotional like education, like how artists try to create emotional education to the audience. No, and this is what I'm trying to do in my work. What happened is that when I do short-term projects, which is like this, like one performance that is an hour, 45 minutes, or an exhibition presentation that is maybe, I don't know, two days. The problem is that in order to challenge the preconceived notion of social behavior, let's say, if you do something so short, it almost gives you, it almost is as, the format gives you only the chance to destroy and dismember and deconstruct something and doesn't give you the chance to build it up again in a different way. So that's where the shock comes in because people feel de deconstruct, feel analyzed, but they don't have the hand that is bringing them to the look, we have reconstructed this for you. So I think why I do that, because I feel it's the responsibility of people to build up again through once they realize what they're doing is not, you know. And this is why I do sometimes long-term projects because then I have time in five years, three years, seven years to this deconstruct, make people aware of what is not working and then together build up something different. And those are, almost more generous projects. They, are, they could be as shocking as the other ones. Some of them are stronger. They're talking about this even stronger and more intense. But because there is the main of the experience, it's, it, it functions in a social timing and not the art timing that is quick, then um, it seems more generous. But it, it sometimes it's even more disturbing, I have to say. Okay, so I, I just want to warn the audience that sometimes, uh, Tania, your um, image gets frozen is yeah. because the internet connectivity in Cuba is really bad. Uh, when it is frozen. Uh, we can hear you, when it is sometimes the image gets frozen. Mm -hmm. uh, Tania, um, uh, expanding on that, could you explain a little bit about the one, um, talking about shocking value, the one at the Venice, Venice Biennial with the Russian roulette, because that was pretty, that was pretty intense. And yeah. um, as far as I know, it was a real thing. It was not yeah. like a farce with the, the, the gun held on your, on your head. So can you explain, a little, because Colombia, you, you did a, a good job at saying why the yeah. code was well, present. The yeah. thing is, uh, I, by the time I was invited to Venice, I had been already invited like two or three times. And one thing I realized is Venice Biennale is quite hard to make a political uh, sphere. Like it's quite hard. People go there uh, to see 300 artworks in one um, day. They're there to to network, to see peers, to go to the parties, to have fun, to enjoy 
to touch the joy of art of the art world. And, and I realized in previous projects I've done, which in which I had the intention to do something political in the work, that it was quite hard. People didn't give enough time to see the work. People were looking for the most flashy, big, impressive thing. And I don't know, I wanted something different. Then of course I realized that's not the format for that maybe, but I wanted to create some political uh, atmosphere um, there. So I decided to do a project. That project I've done twice. First time I did it at the Jeu de Pomme. Uh, the curator was uh, Marina Rodriguez who invited me to do a lecture uh, together with the Brazilian artist, Brazilian uh, theorist. Um, and I wanted to talk about political art and actually make a metaphor. Remember, this is the time when I was doing research on lecture performance uh, format. And I wanted to make a relationship between um, art and politics. And I wanted to show my perspective on what political art was. You have to have to consideration that that piece was done in a moment where the art world was not like today, um, was not so, as art world, was not so into politics. Uh, doing political art was seen as a no-no, like, like uncool. Um, and of course, it, I had that platform to be at the Venice Biennale with so many people who will, will hear it. So I wanted to bring that conversation. I have to say that um, in the book that I did with Claire Bishop for Cisneros collection, I'm plugging in this <laughs> that just came out, I explained quite in detail that project and what I, why I think it worked and why I thought it didn't work. Um, in that case, I feel that um, the illustration I was doing between being a political artist and being able to um, go until the end, until the last consequence. Um, I wanted to explain through this example of the Russian bullet. The one thing that is interesting for me as a performer is that I was, when I studied the Art Institute, I learned about quite a bit um, amount of performances that were looking into the limits of performing. What are the limits of performance? And, you know, we saw the VNS Actionist projects. We saw many, many projects that were quite intense. And it's interesting because when they were narrated, um, you know, that element was in, but, it, you know, it's different when you see it, when you actually see it. And, um, and I also wanted, my work goes always work in three levels. All, I always have a political statement to make in the piece. I always have uh, a personal connection that is broken that I need to fix through the work. And I always make an, um, an art statement or try to figure it out something through art history and so. And in this case, I also wanted, on top of showing people what I thought political art was and so on, I also wanted to experience or, or challenge myself to see what will be the ultimate limit of performing. Of course, uh, after that, we had uh, uh, golf labor and other groups that have done quite impressive political art and I think then is you know the things have changed. Unfortunately one thing that I realized when I was in Venice is that probably people will feel bad and then they go to a beautiful party and they forget about it. So that was a way in which I thought maybe it was not properly done. <laughs> it, context, yeah. it happens, it happens often. Now, let's talk about performance in the context of Latin America, which is a, yeah. a topic that I'm very interested in. Given the steady occurrence of right-wing leftist dictatorships in the region, populist regimes, military juntas, mm -hmm. I mean, you name it, what is the role of performance in societies like this? 
Can a performance artist in Latin America critique the art institution in the same manner than a European or an American do? That's one question. Um, the other one is how do how do authorities? Let me let me see. Okay. So the I other one. Is, what is the role of performance um, art in societies like this, like societies in Latin America? The second question would be, can a performance artist in Latin America critique the art institution in the same manner than a European or an American do? And the third one, which is related to this too, is how do authoritarian, authoritarian governments see performance art? And I say this because, you know, Latin American authoritarian regimes make a lot of use of theater, melodrama, emphasis on feelings, so do you see a connection between this political rhetoric and performance yeah. art in the context of Latin America? Yeah, um, I think um, one of the things that characterize uh, dictatorships and autocracy, but mostly dictatorship and totalitarian regime is the misuse of emotions and is the, the mis misplacement of emotion um, they are societies in which um, you have um, a relationship with politics that is difficult to be rational. It is hard to make rational because it's so emotional. Um, in part because your basic rights are completely um, um, taken from you and because um, you almost feel um, hopeless in terms of uh, strategies to fight back. So that of course bring the, the, the relationship between the citizen and the dictatorship uh, into a level that is more emotional that, that intellectual or, or, you know, or yeah. So I think uh, it is a big difference. And this is some, one of the reasons I actually started putting, creating this concept like arte de conducta, arte util, uh, and so on, was precisely because when I was studying art at the Art Institute, which was a great school, but it was at that time, this is like 99, um, it was, it was not so often to have a class where you had all the references, either from African American community, from native uh, societies, or from Latin America. So basically, I, I, I came from that tradition from Latin America, from seeing things from Cuba. And then when I arrived to Europe and the United States, it was so different. It was very different. One of the big differences is the use of the I in, in um, United States and, and Europe at that time. Now we are in a very politicized um, situation. We are in a uh, pre-totalitarian society in the United States. So, so of course things are speeding up differently. But at that time, the, the use of the I was very clear. In performance, the I was related to a personal story that was supposed to become a history. In Latin America, I saw. Wait, I'm sorry, Tania, Tania, could you explain? Could you explain that a little bit? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, in the sense of uh, you had performances happening, starting from a personal experience or locating it in the, in the, in the being, in the self, but with the hope that that will reflect um, as, a, as a collective um, issue. In Latin America, I think the process was the opposite. There was a collective issue that was very latent, you say, like very strong, very uh, probably happening on the ground but everybody knew about it, things maybe nobody could talk about. And then you use yourself you know, as a conduit for the process is kind of reverse, you know? 
um, it doesn't usually in the performance in, in this dictatorship and so on, you don't come out of your personal story. You are used as a vessel for other people's stories. I don't know if it's, if I'm, I'm, I'm being clear here. And this is why I also think that there is a difference with Latin American performance and European and uh, US performance where I see Latin American performances, political Latin American performance, because of course there are every kind of performance, but the political um, performance from Latin America, they use gestures instead of actions. And I feel that in the US generally, um, performance are actions, meaning something in which you have to enter the, um, I don't know, the world of the artist, the inside, um, you know, world of the artist to understand the things it's bringing to you. But in Latin America, you come out of a collective knowledge of the meaning of things that are very clear and speak without speaking. So there is a different complicity when you are in the dictatorship where you're talking about things everybody knows, but everybody's pretending not to see in the performance that is happening in front of them, because then they become part of that conversation, you know. And in 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 the US, at least those kind of from the 70s, the 80s, and so on, the clearer you are, the better, you know. It is about exposing you know if you're working about hiv you are clear about it. you show the blood you show you know the very clear very clear the, the the distance between the issue you're talking about and the experience the person has it is tried to be quite close in in dictatorship there is a level of translation that needs to be done in order to sometimes because they are self-censored their self-censored uh, projects, you know. So I don't know if that explained a little bit of that. And, uh, and one of the reasons I think performance is so important during dictatorship is what I said before, there are a way to criticize a government surpassing their censorship because you're talking first to the people and to the public. You know, and this is something that happens because the sources of, of performance. Um, and you say how authoritarian regimes see performance, well, they performance as a threat, basically. They performance as a threat because they understand that there is nothing more dangerous in an authoritarian or dictatorship assisted dictatorship than people getting excited about something or people getting ideas, you know, but they could do something that seemed impossible. Okay, Tanya, um, so you say that in, in, in this kind of regimes, uh, performance is a way in a, uh, to reenact a collective trauma. And that's the mm -hmm. value of performance in societies like this, that you reenact a collective trauma and people can completely empathize with what you are presenting to them. And it's, let's say, a way of... Uh, um, um, for example, for example, yeah. for example, you do a performance where you take something out of your vagina and read the text of, out of your vagina, you still have, it is showing intense, but you still have the critical distance to see that from you, like something you want to analyze from afar. You can have the possibility to, but in totalitarian and dictatorships, you can't. Right. Because what the person is talking in the performance is your reality. Something either you haven't been able to say because you're afraid, or something that you repress, or something you have to you have to pay the price for. for. It is you say a collective trauma, you know, there is no, no, are you against, in favor or against abortion? It's not that, that, uh, emotionally, you want to, I mean, of course it is emotionally charged for those societies, but I don't really uh, explain myself, you know, almost like, so let me ask you, me? so, um, uh, going off from that, what is then, 
the relationship between a performance artist in these societies and the institution, because that's an important part of the puzzle. What, mm -hmm. what, how, how does the institution, uh, how, do, how do you negotiate as a performance artist with an institution in regimes like this? Because this the institutions are not autonomous. We have to, I mean, the audience needs to know that they are not autonomous institutions or private institutions. So they are state-run mm -hmm. institutions. One of the reasons, and going back to a question before, one of the reasons totalitarian system dictatorship we are sort of performance is because we don't need institutions to, to, to this. You can go outside the street and do an action, you know, or you don't need the gallery, you don't need a curator, you, you can do your action, you can come with a group of friends and do something in the street like for example, the group uh, Arte Calle did a lot in the 80s, or some artists just show up and did an action or, or gesture. So I think the relation between artists in general, I don't think it's only performance artists. I think arts in general and institutions, territorial regimes, are extremely tense because usually in these systems, the government the state of the government tried to control uh, the art production because they see art production as part of propaganda. You know, art is not, um, art is used to demonstrate how developed the country is because look how many artists we have and look how happy they are. Look how beautiful the palm trees they're painting are. You know, so they are very, also very aware of, of the meaning of things. Sometimes, this is a personal experience, sometimes I've been censored without even doing the work because they already, knowing who I am and how I do stuff, they are like a minority report trying to imagine what I'm going to do next and they're censoring it before I thought about the project. That's the level of craziness that you have here. Um, you also have a situation where institutions feel they owe the right of doing art. What I mean by that, I'm giving an example, Cuba is one I have closest. They created the, the 349, which is a, a law, to regulate and decide, the institution decide who is and is not an artist. The institution decides what is and what is not art. And the institution decides that if you are, which is actually very hard because it's against the, 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 the main um, ideas of the revolution at the beginning when they started, which was anybody can be an artist, can do whatever they want, let's you know, be now they created the figure, this 349, that is the intruder, the art intruder. People are trying to um, embody or, or pass as artists and they're not. You know, like for example, in the US, you have this law where you cannot impersonate the agent or police, something like that, right? Well, in Cuba, these are two artists. The government decides who is artist and who is not artist. And if they say you're not an artist, then they say you are an intruder. You pass, you're trying to pass as artists, which is completely insane. You put it in the movie and people will say, you so probably will not do it, you know? So yeah, the, the relation is quite tense and they have the total control of not only what is art and what is not art, but also there is a list that everyone knows exists, and I've said twice, there is an official list of the artists who are um, um, permitted to receive uh, collectors and to receive visits from U.S. Uh, uh, academic uh, groups or collectors or curators. And if you're not on that list, Mean, means that you have to behave in a way the government doesn't like it. So there is also a way to control artists in institution uh, through the opportunities, you know, to the fact that, of course, you know, if you are a dancer, for example, you have a very determined time in life to do your work. 
maybe you don't meet with the producer from, I don't know, um, American Ballet Theater will come to, to see the dancers, then your dance is gone. But they use that, you know, uh, or a collector of a gallery is gone. So I think there is also a relationship that is very uh, toxic because um, it's in constant, um, um, it's in, in contact, um, what's it, I'm uh, in English, um, blackmail, it's in contact blackmail. The relation with the institution is permanent blackmail. Could you repeat that, Tanya, because you were breaking during the last... Um... The, the relationship with the institutions is a complete and constant blackmail. Okay, blackmail, okay. Uh, now, let's focus on your work on uh, Cuba, and I'm going to share some images here. Yeah. Uh, your work and performances have been truly transgressive in direct confrontation with the Castro brothers' dictatorship. Uh, let's name a few. In 1993, you created an on-the-ground newspaper here, uh, mimicking the format of Grama, which is the uh, official Cuban Communist Party daily. Here, you investigated the ways in which the Castro's regime constantly rewrites history. In 2000, as part of the seventh Havana Biennial, you put nude male performers standing atop mounds of sugar cane in near total darkness inside a vault at the Cabana Fortress a military bunker used as a jail to torture and eventually execute the political opposition during the first years of the Cuban revolution. The performance was only illuminated by a TV screen, so you can see it here, hanging from the ceiling. A TV screen um, showing a video of Fidel Castro. Liana, I have to say that the image doesn't show the experience because you enter a completely dark space, long space. It was uh, 50 meter, which is 150 feet long. And you could only see the little light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And you couldn't see the naked people. Yeah. Yeah, this was completely only in the original. Uh, this is a picture that I found, but the, in, in the original performance, it was completely no, no, dark. That's, that's the one I did to show the elements of the project, but actually, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there was a, a, a picture, a video of Fidel Castro unbuttoning, among other things, on a loop, unbuttoning his military uniform to reveal that he was not wearing a bulletproof vest. And then in 2002, you launched Arte de Conducta, or the Behavioral Art School, a public artwork that also functioned as a participatory art school in order to foster a new generation of less commercially driven, more politically active, active artists in Cuba. Now the question is, do you think that using art as a political tool is effective in regimes like the Cuban one? Is yes, that Yes, that using art as a political tool is effective in regimes yes. like the Cuban one? I, I think so because the Cuban, the Cuban uh, regime or government, let me hear you properly, um, is uh, using a, um, a very sophisticated um, um, artistic, let's say, uh, resources. They are they have been masters of using symbolism, uh, metaphor, all the things we use to do art. So I think it is quite effective because they understand the um, the impact of images. They understand the impact of experiences and this is almost the same uh, somehow it is uh, entering the rain because that's what they use when you go to a rally with a million people organized by the government where maybe 85 percent of the people don't want to be there yeah, that's them creating an experience a bodily bodily experience you will remember in a, in a space of your brain that is maybe not a, so intellectual, you know? So yeah, I definitely think it is the right way to talk to it. But at the same time, I, I think political art has to be done in a fashion, where, in a way that it is, um, that it is, 
using the element of powers. When you show the newspaper, what I did was taking something that was solely the, the property of the government, which is the media. Uh, this is, of course, before um, internet and so on, no? 92, 93. Um, and um, so I think in order for art to make governments shake, to make governments pay attention, you have to use some of the resources they use. You have to use some of the strategies they use so they can identify themselves, they can recognize. Because you see just a painting that is super symbolic and people won't get it very, I'm not going to worry about that. Don't worry when they see something that is direct, that is talking language, and where you are discovering or veiling the strategies they have used to manipulate people. So I think it is a very specific art you have to do. Uh, because of course, for example, uh, here I have seen uh, artists who have worked that is you know, literally against the government. And the government has sometimes absorbed them in a way in which they um, reconfigure the content of the work reconfigure the, the, the meaning of the work and make it look like uh, not a criticism, but an uh, alabanza, no? uh, uh, something in favor of them. So, so I think this is all why when you do in my experience, there are ways to do stuff, but in my experience has worked best is when I don't use so much symbolism in the political work or metaphors in the political work, but I use the creation of reality. So it's not about presenting, figure it out by yourself, bring, uh, fill the empty gaps. It's not about, I'm very direct. I use the same elements you use, and I'm actually adding a layer to what you have done. So I don't know if that is clear, is too abstract, but yeah, that's, that's so. Yeah, well, you, you broke a little bit at the end. Danny, unfortunately, the, oh. the internet connection is, is really bad. Um, but, but we don't have a lot of time, and I want to uh, ask you the last question, and then the audience is completely, I mean, it's totally invited to um, uh, put their uh, Q&A questions. I mean, their, their questions on the chat. And after this last question, I will start reading some of the questions that the audience may have for you. And the last question is uh, your last initiative, which is INSTAR, the International Institute of Artivism. And you are aware of the importance of the figure of Hannah Arendt for the new school. First of all, why you chose her name? for your project. Second, mm -hmm. how can we see your term activism, art plus activism, applied in today's Cuba, uh, where political dissidents and yourself are ferociously harassed and persecuted by the government? Um, so the question would be how feasible is to raise political awareness among everyday Cubans, because part of the ink study is like to appeal to housewives, uh, bus drivers, I mean, everyday Cubans, how feasible is to raise political awareness among them, among a population who have been politically indoctrinated for the last 60 years? Okay. Uh, I have to say that um, I discovered Hannah Arendt uh, by chance, I went to, to, the, to a library, a bookstore in Spain, and I saw a book called The Promise of Politics, and I liked the title. And I read it and I was in love. I was like, oh my God, this is exactly, you know, things that I needed to understand and they are explained in such a way that I get it. Of course, I might not get the whole subtlety behind them, but I was very excited. So I started reading all more of her work and, and looking for, for some of her um, books. And of course, when I read The Origin of Totalitarianism, 
of course, I will. And then I realized, I, I read the book, The Origin of Totalitarianism, uh, the, and I really was fascinated that she was not only focused on the communist and socialist aspect of it, but also the capitalist uh, potential for, for totalitarianism right now, I think. Um, so I like that uh, her way of thinking, and also I, I, I was fascinated by how much importance she gave to the idea of truth and how non-negotiable that was. And of course, the, when I read um, the text about Ashman, I was completely you know, amazed by the whole process, like how she did, how she handled that, you know. So, so yeah, so I also felt that um, it was important. It was funny because in the interrogation uh, session, the interrogator say, why do you use a foreigner uh, for the name of your institution? You know, like it, it was very mad that I used that. And then I say, well, why do you use Marx, Engels, Ho Chi Minh, uh, Che Guevara, and uh, all these other names of people? Uh, that are also foreign, but only men in your institutions. So yeah, so I think it is it is a way for me to indicate as well to to the people that um, with whom I'm trying to dialogue, in which is also part of the government. What are the positions we want to take? So yeah. Um, um, I have to say that in order, in talking about being a, a space for civic education and activism, I think that's not only um, related to, to, to the humans, because we are living a situation here where we see how indoctrinated the foreigners are. And this is something that has caught my attention uh, for a while, I identify myself as a leftist, but I have a very difficult time talking to people from left about what is happening in Cuba, almost as if they don't want to hear it, almost as if they don't want to engage in a critical conversation, and therefore what is happening is they're leaving the space descent only to the right thing. So, so this is the thing that I also, we also try to generate in the Institute. And the, for example, just to give you an example, there are many academic trips to Cuba and they all feel like, um, it almost remind me of the trips they do to Israel with the young people, that they, they come to Israel, they know the culture and they get out of their, let's say indoctrinated or fascinated in a way well, um, I have met people who have come to Cuba who actually today recognize the injustices that they are living in, but they have me. For me, it's impossible to decide because it's the, time, it's the place where I made love for the first time. Or I have people saying, it's impossible to me to criticize Cuba because I went there when I was 15, 16 to this academic exchange project and was having such a happy time. So it almost feels that there is a disparity between, um, and it's something we're interested in the Institute as well, there is a disparity between the reality and the way in which that reality has been conveyed to people. Um, and it's funny because I was remembered the other day talking to you, Ileana, about, um, it, it reminded me uh, what happened during Franco time. I, I have a friend who is working researching postcards that were sent to, uh, by English people to the families where they were on vacation in the beach in uh, during Franco's, Spanish Franco. And how beautiful the sun was, how happy they were, how amazing and how happy the people were in Spain. And it almost feel exactly the same thing people say about Cuba. You know, so I, I have this, um, yeah, it is, it is part also of an addition that's for inside Cuba in which we are trying people to understand that 
civic education is the answer to, to frustration, to, to violence, because violence is when you don't have other options. So, but at the same time, we want to make sure that people understand what is happening and to respect our right to defend what we believe in, to protest, you know, is, is uh, yeah. And, and at the same time, I know that there is a situation in where Cuba is not Russia or China, meaning no cares. Like we are not going to make a huge trend in the global economy. We are not going to make a huge trend in the nuclear war. You know, so therefore, here is Cuba with the beach and people who are being censored and pressed, but we have fun beach, you know. So basically, uh, Tanya, you're saying that um, you have a you have a problem with this fetishization of Cuba as this um, socialist paradise, something that I always encounter and 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 and. It's, it's recurrent to think uh, of Cuba with this romanticism and a Cuba that doesn't exist anymore or maybe never existed in that regard. And how- uh, no, and, also, and also also people who think that the Cuba today is the Cuba where uh, the government was interested primarily in the social justice. The Cuban government right now is interested in surviving not being out of power. Right now, for example, Monsanto was forbidden in Cuba and I was so happy. I was like, wow, that's, that's great. That's a good decision by the government. And then a few months later, a new news came that it was basically the Cuban government is trying its own genetic because they don't believe in manipulation of you know, the because they want to do it themselves and things like that you know right now for example the the, um, the egalitarian you know the same-sex marriage was uh, supposed to be uh, put into consideration for the constitution and the government considered to the uh, Christian uh, treasure because they still will go into the street and um, march against that. So why the solution is to take out a, a project for same-sex marriage that has been in the making for 10 years is to say, okay, let's have march, you march and the other people also march, you know, or let's have a debate. Let's have a compromises, say what are arguments, and let's have a person from the LGBTQ movement and say what are their arguments. No, the reasoning is we eliminate the problem. No sex and same sex sex. And like that. So it almost feels that what is uh, driving this government at the moment is just to not be kicked out of power. And for that, they will do basically almost whatever. Okay, so let me um, read one of the questions in the chat. Um, it says, as a female Latin American performance artist, how do, um, how do you think recent trends in beauty and self-enhancement through plastic surgery, which sexualize and commodify the idealized curvy body stemming from the trend of wives and mistresses of narco traffickers, playing to the idea of the despotic autocratic control and regulation of the female artist's body. Uh, do you believe the policy of beauty standards originating from the male gaze affects the potency and message of your work, particularly in Latin America where beauty enhancement surgeries reigns one of the most prevalent in the world? Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of bizarre. I never had a question because I'm actually opposite that. I never had a surgery, and but it's not the the epitome of the beauty of the body. Uh, but no, I think it is uh, almost that when you do performance, you have to be very clear who is your ideal audience, and to understand. And something I always do to understand that imagining the audience you will perform for is not um 
square thing is something coming out of many different um, sides. And to try to imagine if you are interested, for example, a person who gave this, what is the name? The person who gave the question? Julia. Julia. Um, yes. Julia, if you were to say that, I think they have, if it were me, you have to understand where that comes from. Because one, one thing that happens to art sometimes is that we react to the outcomes. And then we base most of our reaction in art about the reaction to outcomes. But I think more interesting would be to see why this happened, where it comes from, who formed that case. You know, so in order to have a different, um, you know, more in depth conversation actually will shake people instead of because if you think through the exterior thing, you know, then people will be, I don't like I agree, but if you go to a core to understand why people have emotional needs, uh, canalize this then maybe you can have a different, a more honest conversation with them. Okay, uh, Omar is asking, uh, I was curious about your view on political art in contemporary art spaces. Is there a difference in creating political performances for a general larger public versus an art world audience? How should artists navigate the art world when creating political work? Well, our world, uh, I always say that I like art. I like artists and I don't like the art. So, but at the same time, it is um, our natural, it's like our friends, parents, cousins. There is conversation that goes across our history that has been and has through the art world also. I think we are at this moment, maybe not so much anymore, but we have been for a long time seen an art world that is not related to the experience of the artists. Seen an art world in which people who decide what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, what is interested and what is not interested, and not people from the same class, from the same interest, and from the same experiences than artists or the people in general. So it almost feels like we have lived for a long time under some sort of hijacking in the art world, um, class hijack. Um, and fortunately, I've seen, for example, great stories. And then through time, they start responding to the interests of those collectors or those donors, uh, et cetera, instead of the us. So I feel that as a political artist, and I always say, my work is not only to criticize governments or structural power that are in politics, but also the politics of the art world. And we have that responsibility. If you don't fight against all justices in the art world, then responsibility um, and it's our, let's say we are not political artists because political artists not only criticizing law or criticizing how Trump uh, engaged in the stupidity, but it is also to bring uh, to understand impact of politics also in our um, environment, which they are world. And this is our responsibility. We have to do it more and more. If we don't have a school system from inside, then yeah. I don't know if that answers it, but yeah. Okay, so um, I think we're running a little bit late and um, um, I don't know. Have... Yes, Tania? Yeah. Yes, so um, I think this is going to be it. Um, Joshua, I don't know if you would like to add something, but um, uh, on my behalf, thank you so much, Tania, for this uh, very informative so talk. And uh, despite all the difficulty, technical difficulties, I know that in Cuba, it's, it's really difficult and challenging to have connectivity. And that's one of the things that uh, 
made this uh, um, uh, uh, talk really um, enriching. Um, and, and this is something that, I mean, the, the reality of Cuba is something that, that the audience, I, uh, I think, is very grateful to know through your words. And um, I think that's the it. Thing, yes. Yeah, the only thing I want to add to Omar's question is doing political art quite uncomfortable. It's so worth it. It's uncomfortable, but very worth it. Okay. And Tanya, is there something, is there any project you're working on right now at this very moment? Yeah, well, I just finished the book, Claire Bishop. Uh, it just came out uh, two, two weeks ago. And I'm working on the uh, play, uh, Galileo, The Life of Galileo by Bray. So I'm doing an adaptation of that. What I'm interested in the play is the moment in which you have to decide uh, to betray your beliefs and live or to defend your belief and die. Okay. Yeah. And recently you also had this project with um, uh, a chorus for a political prisoner in Cuba. You were... No, I'm working on that. I'm actually uh, working now on the format. Um, yes, we, one thing we've done is, I mean, Cuba, uh, a police in Cuba killed um, a black uh, young man. Do you hear Same. So, yeah? Uh -huh. Yes. So, so in Cuba, we had this situation where one police, two policemen killed one black human male. And we, um, you know, we went out to demonstrate and we got prison and so on. This uh, I thought. And after that, um, there is this list of more than 134 prisoners, conscience and political prisoners in Cuba. And a group of artists uh, came up with the idea of uh, reading the old names, doing um, a friend of ours called Tito. Uh, he actually um, made a beautiful soundtrack for this. Um, and working on a video will show the images of each of them. And this is important because people think there's no, no prisoner, uh, prisoners of conscience in Cuba, or they are not prison, political prisoners, and they are. There are more than 130, which is quite a lot in Cuba, which is such a small place. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay, great. So I think this is going to be it. Um, Tanya, again, thank you so much for this wonderful evening. And I hope the audience had also enjoyed your talk and know more about performance art and, and, and Latin America and Cuba. And with this, uh, we say goodbye and um, good luck with all your endeavors. <laughs>